One of its outstanding characteristics is noticed in the fact that all impressions which reach it, either through outside suggestion or auto-suggestion, are recorded together in groups which harmonize in nature. The negative impressions are stored away all in one portion of the brain, while the positive impressions are stored in another portion. When one of these impressions or past experiences is called into the conscious mind, through the principle of memory, there is a tendency to recall with it all others of a similar nature, just as the raising of one link of a chain brings up other links with it. For example, anything that causes a feeling of doubt to arise in a person's mind is sufficient to call forth all of his experiences which caused him to become doubtful. If a man is asked by a stranger to cash a check, immediately he remembers having cashed checks that were not good, or of having heard of others who did so. Through the law of association, all similar emotions, experiences, and sense impressions that reach the mind are filed away together, so that the recalling of one has a tendency to bring back to memory all the others. To arouse a feeling of distrust in a person's mind has a tendency to bring to the surface every doubt-building experience that the person ever had. For this reason, successful salesmen endeavor to keep away from the discussion of subjects that may arouse the buyer's chain of doubt impressions, which he has stored away by reason of previous experiences. The successful salesman quickly learns that knocking a competitor or a competing article may result in bringing to the buyer's mind certain negative emotions growing out of previous experiences, which may make it impossible for the salesman to neutralize the buyer's mind. This principle applies to and controls every sense impression that is lodged in the human mind. Take the feeling of fear, for example. The moment we permit a single emotion that is related to fear to reach the conscious mind, it calls with it all of its unsavory relations. A feeling of courage cannot claim the attention of the conscious mind while a feeling of fear is there. One or the other must dominate. They make poor roommates because they do not harmonize in nature. Like attracts like. Every thought held in the conscious mind has a tendency to draw to it other thoughts of a similar nature. You see, therefore, that... These feelings, thoughts, and emotions growing out of past experiences, which claim the attention of the conscious mind, are backed by a regular army of supporting soldiers of a similar nature that stand ready to aid them in their work. Deliberately place in your own mind, through the principle of auto-suggestion, the ambition to succeed through the aid of a definite chief aim, and notice how quickly all of your latent or undeveloped ability in the nature of past experiences will become stimulated and aroused to action in your behalf. Plant in a boy's mind, through the principle of suggestion, the ambition to become a successful lawyer or doctor or engineer or businessman or financier, and if you plant that suggestion deeply enough and keep it there by repetition, it will begin to move that boy toward the achievement of the object of that ambition. If you would plant a suggestion deeply, mix it generously with enthusiasm for enthusiasm is the fertilizer that will ensure its rapid growth as well as its permanency. When that kind-hearted old gentleman planted in my mind the suggestion that I was a bright boy and that I could make my mark in the world if I would educate myself, it was not so much what he said as it was the way in which he said it that made such a deep and lasting impression on my mind. It was the way in which he gripped my shoulders and the look of confidence in his eyes that drove his suggestion so deeply into my subconscious mind that it never gave me any peace until I commenced taking the steps that led to the fulfillment of the suggestion. This is a point that I would stress with all the power at my command. It is not so much what you say as it is the tone and manner in which you say it that makes a lasting impression. It naturally follows, therefore, that sincerity of purpose, honesty, and earnestness must be placed back of all that one says if one would make a lasting and favorable impression. Whatever you successfully sell to others, you must first sell to yourself. Not long ago I was approached by an agent of the government of Mexico who sought my services as a writer of propaganda for the administration in charge at that time. His approach was about as follows. Whereas Senor has a reputation as an exponent of the Golden Rule philosophy, and whereas Senor is known throughout the United States as an independent who is not allied with any political faction, now, therefore, would Senor be gracious enough to come to Mexico, study the economic and political affairs of that country, 
then return to the United States and write a series of articles to appear in the newspapers, recommending to the people of America the immediate recognition of Mexico by the government of the United States, etc. For this service I was offered more money than I shall perhaps ever possess during my entire life. But I refused the commission, and for a reason that will fail to impress anyone except those who understand the principle which makes it necessary for all who would influence others to remain on good terms with their own conscience. I could not write convincingly of Mexico's cause for the reason that I did not believe in that cause. Therefore, I could not have mixed sufficient enthusiasm with my writing to have made it effective, even though I had been willing to prostitute my talent and dip my pen into ink that I knew to be muddy. I will not endeavor further to explain my philosophy on this incident for the reason that those who are far enough advanced in the study of autosuggestion will not need further explanation, while those who are not far enough advanced would not and could not understand. Conceit is a fog which envelops a man's real character beyond his own recognition. It weakens his native ability and strengthens all his inconsistencies. Is there not food for thought in the fact that no newspaper has ever published any account of wild drinking parties or other similar scandals in connection with the names of Edison, Ford, Rockefeller, and most of the other really big fellows? No man can afford to express, through words or acts, that which is not in harmony with his own belief. And if he does so, he must pay by the loss of his ability to influence others. Please read aloud the foregoing paragraph. It is worth emphasizing by repetition, for lack of observation of the principle upon which it is based, constitutes the rocks and reefs upon which many a man's definite chief aim dashes itself to pieces. I do not believe that I can afford to try to deceive anyone about anything, but I know that I cannot afford to try to deceive myself. To do so would destroy the power of my pen and render my words ineffective. It is only when I write with the fire of enthusiasm burning in my heart that my writing impresses others favorably, and it is only when I speak from a heart that is bursting with belief in my message that I can move my audience to accept that message. I would also have you read aloud the foregoing paragraph. Yes, I would have you commit it to memory. Even more than this, I would have you write it out and place it where it may serve as a daily reminder of a principle, nay, a law, as immutable as the law of gravitation, without which you can never become a power in your chosen life work. There have been times, and many of them, when it appeared that if I stood by this principle it would mean starvation. There have been times when my closest friends and business advisors have strongly urged me to shade my philosophy for the sake of gaining a needed advantage here and there. But somehow I have managed to cling to it, mainly, I suppose, for the reason that I have preferred peace and harmony in my own heart to the material gain that I might have had by a forced compromise with my conscience. Strange as it may seem, my deliberations and conclusions on this subject of refusing to strangle my own conscience have seldom been based upon what is commonly called honesty. That which I have done in the matter of refraining from writing or speaking anything that I did not believe has been solely a question of honor between my conscience and myself. I have tried to express that which my heart dictated because I have aimed to give my words flesh. It might be said that my motive was based more upon self-interest than it was on a desire to be fair with others, although I have never desired to be unfair with others, so far as I am able to analyze myself. No man can become a master salesman if he compromises with falsehood. Murder will out, and even though no one ever catches him red-handed in expressing that which he does not believe, his words will fail in the accomplishment of their purpose because he cannot give them flesh. If they do not come from his heart, and if they are not mixed with genuine, unadulterated enthusiasm. I would also have you read aloud the foregoing paragraph, for it embraces a great law that you must understand and apply before you can become a person of influence in any undertaking. In making these requests for the sake of emphasis, I am not trying to take undue liberties with you. I am giving you full credit for being an adult, a thinker, an intelligent person. Yet I know how likely you are to skip over these vital laws without being sufficiently impressed by them to make them a part of your own workaday philosophy. I know your weakness, because I know my own. 
It has required the better part of 25 years of ups and downs, mostly downs, to impress these basic truths upon my own mind so that they influenced me. I have tried both them and their opposites. Therefore, I can speak not as one who merely believes in their soundness, but as one who knows. And what do I mean by these truths? So that you cannot possibly misunderstand my meaning and so that these words of warning cannot possibly convey an abstract meaning, I will state that by these truths I mean this. You cannot afford to suggest to another person, by word of mouth or by an act of yours, that which you do not believe. Surely that is plain enough. And the reason you cannot afford to do so is this. If you compromise with your own conscience, it will not be long before you will have no conscience. For your conscience will fail to guide you, just as an alarm clock will fail to awaken you if you do not heed it. Surely that is plain enough also. And how do I happen to be an authority on this vital subject, do you ask? I am an authority because I have experimented with the principle until I know how it works. But, you may ask, how do I know that you are telling the truth? The answer is that you will know only by experimenting for yourself and by observing others who faithfully apply this principle and those who do not apply it. If my evidence needs backing, then consult any man whom you know to be a person who has tried to get by without observing this principle, and if he will not or cannot give you the truth, you can get it nevertheless by analyzing the man. 